Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he had led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames from within a bush. Moses saw though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, Here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I, that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Exodus 3, verse 1 through 15. What is up, church? By the Glades, good to see you. We got real live people in the house. Give it up for your neighbor right now, your neighbor who's six feet away. Whether you're here at Sawgrass or Lake Worth campus, glad you're here. These are the two campuses online right now. We still have the vast majority of our people watching via the internet, so we have some cameras, but y'all can see me. If you can't see me, just move a little bit. Won't hurt anybody's feelings. Uh, but thanks for being here in the room. In the room. In fact, I think what's most powerful is, thank you for being here for the entire service, but worship. You know, worship, you know, I, I don't know, maybe you went at, at, on home, online, you're there singing your guts out by yourself with your hands raised, with your family, but you're probably making your bagel and your coffee and listening to the worship here to watch you engage. Come on, come on. There's something about singing and praising God together. You feel the same way, anybody? Make a little noise if you do, because I, I sure feel better about my singing when you drown me out. I just really do. So there's something so powerful and moving. It always brings a tear to your eyes. So thank you for being here. Let's jump into it. Exodus chapter 3 is our text. Exodus chapter C. Say it with me loudly. Exodus chapter 3. Put in the chat right now. Louder. Exodus chapter 3. There you go. There you go. We're still kind of slight numbers. Most folks are staying away. But spread the word. It's safe. Spread the word, we've done everything possible to make you feel safe. Did you feel safe this morning as you came on campus? We're really being careful about that. And as the guidelines change, we, we will morph somewhat too, so hang in there. But uh, thank you for following those protocols. We're gonna keep you safe and inspire you at the same time. Exodus chapter three. Let me pick up the idea if you missed last, last week. We have opened our physical doors to our campuses. So I thought I gotta call the next little theme, you know, the doors are open. The doors are open. And I want to pick up off the language that shows up in the Bible from time to time. The Bible talks about this idea of God opening a door, meaning opening a door of opportunity, or God providing a door for you to step into your potential, or even go through the door of your divine destiny. The Bible teaches you are a person that God has infused with divine purpose. Now, sadly, just because God's provided the door, a lot of people falter, don't go through the door, don't understand the door, and miss out on so much. So while you're finding Exodus chapter 3, I'll give you an example. So if you came to visit me and Lisa at our house, here's our door. I took a picture with my, my cell phone here. Here's the door to our house. You'd walk up to our door, and uh, I mean, I like our doors. They're kind of pretty, but people get confused because here's a question. Where's the doorbell? 
Do you see the doorbell there? It's, 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 y'all are quiet. Do you see the doorbell? Do you see it? Raise your hand if you see it. Raise your hand if you see it. Anybody see it? Uh, all right, all right. I got like two. All right, kind of behind this, I don't know what this weird plant is on the right. There's like, it's not marijuana. It looks like marijuana. It's not, it's, it's not. <laughs> it's not marijuana. Just say it. It's not marijuana. Some people here are applauding for marijuana. I'm not even sure about that. Just <laughs> you see like an old school intercom and the house was built in the 90s and that's the old intercom. It's like a little doorbell thing, but no one ever sees it. So unless you, you know, you know, it's there, they don't ring it. So if you're at a house and you don't see a doorbell, what do you do? What do you do? Yeah, you, you, you knock. So people, of course, friends who've never been over before or a delivery person with my food will stand there and knock at that door. But here is the deal. That's not the door to our house. We have a courtyard home. So we have a courtyard. That is the door to the courtyard. So it's like a, like a porch and a pool. And, 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 and some distance away is the actual front door to our house. And so if you're just knocking at that outside courtyard door, we can't hear you. And so we had friends call us. Like, I've been knocking. Aren't you guys home? I'm like, no, that's not really the door. Delivery people just leave the stuff there, right? So, so you got to come inside to the actual door to our house. Why that delineation? I think for a lot of people, religion is the courtyard door. Wow. Wow. You know, well intended, but you, you're working, you're, you're knocking, you feel like you're not really connecting with God, you know, not having an intimacy with God. You're kind of confused on how to pass through the doorway of your purpose, though you, you work hard. Religion with its ritual and sometimes with its, its abundance of rules, it's kind of like the outside door. What God wants from you is more like the inside door. See, the outside door is religion. The inside door is relationship. What God wants from you and with you is a relationship. What, what God wants, what the Bible describes, I think is a divine romance. God wants intimacy with you. God wants to be your savior and your friend. Your healer, healer, and your father. He wants to be all those things. So you got to step, not just the door of religion. I'm not knocking religion, but you got to step into relationship with God. That's the door. So the idea of the door shows up a lot. You stay in Exodus chapter three. I'm going to show you somebody very famous passing through the door of his destiny. But I'll show you a couple examples of this idea of a door in the Bible. Fascinating idea. Uh, I mentioned last week a great one, Revelation chapter three, verse eight. As Jesus talks to a small marginalized church, it would be in modern day, modern day Turkey. And this church was under pressure. It was being persecuted, man. All kinds of heat on this church. But look what Jesus says in verse eight. It's what? By the way, the new LEDs, can you, can you give it up for the production team? They were busy while we were home. They built these for us. I mean, how the Apostle Paul had there even preached without LEDs? I don't even know. Here you go. So if you can see the scripture here on the giant LED, the speaker here is Jesus, which is really cool. So Jesus says, see, I have planted, I have placed before you an open door. Open door. Look how it concludes. That no one can shut. Wow. Yeah, you can applaud that. That's pretty incredible. What a promise. Now, what I believe that means is he's saying to this church, guess what? He goes, I'm going to open a door of effective ministry. I'm going to open a door of blessing. I'm going to open a door of new potential for you. Now, if you look at that and go, wow. So I guess when Jesus opens a door like that, uh, he, he sweeps all the problems away. All the challenges are gone. You just kind of step through and skip through this open door. It'd be nice. I don't think that's what it's talking about. How do I know that? Always use the Bible to help you understand the Bible. Here's another passage about the open door uh, that shows up. I love this one. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Uh, it's on the screen right now, verse 9. And the Apostle Paul wrote the Corinthian letters, both 1 and 2 Corinthians, from, from uh, Ephesus. He's in Ephesus. What's he doing? Church work, ministry, sharing Christ, encouraging people, building that church in Ephesus. All right, so he says this. For a great door, in fact, he wanted to come to the Corinthians. He said, I can't come right now because I'm busy doing this. And here's why I can't come right now. For a great door is open to me, filled with opportunities and many. Commingled with the divine door, opportunity and opposition. That's all true. I mean, he, we're being blessed, he's saying. People are coming to Christ, he's saying. Now we're seeing progress. We're seeing divine momentum. We're seeing, I gotta say, God has opened this door. At the same time, the devil's not gonna just sit back and watch you waltz into your promised land. So try to discourage you, even dissuade you from stepping through the door. 
You see, Moses is battling that kind of dilemma in Exodus chapter 3. Today, once again, in the next couple of weeks, I, I want to study what I would argue is not just the most famous conversation in the Bible, but one of the most fascinating and famous conversations in history. This conversation of Moses and God by way of the burning bush, by the way, we talked about last week, if you missed last week, what a fascinating verbal vehicle a burning bush was for God to choose and use. But in this famous conversation, it's been just not documented in scripture. It's been dramatically demonstrated in movie after movie. The famous Hollywood movies that won Academy Awards on the story of Moses, and they all include this fascinating and famous conversation, Exodus chapter three, chapter four. That's your homework this week. Read those if you will. And, uh, and listen, I'll I, I confess this. Pastors, because what Moses says after being you know, in Midian for 40 years, he's an octogenarian. He's, he's an older guy. What he says in response to God saying, guess what, Moses? This is your moment. Step through the door. What he says, those excuses, they're kind of superficial. And even kind of silly, I'm not jamming Moses, but you know, we, pastors, we, we, Fred, we pick on poor Moses. And I want to give Moses some credit. You see, one thing happened here, Moses had no idea this conversation was going to happen. Right. And sometimes in life, you, you know you're about to have a conversation with someone who's important, your boss or your, your professor, and you kind of prepare yourself, you mentally script out a, a verbal scenario. Moses had no idea. Ever been surprised by someone? Yeah. Someone important? Yeah. All right, y'all being quiet, I'll give an example. Uh, make some noise if you are a fan of Pirates of the Caribbean. Go. That's it? Wait, wait. The movie or the ride? The movie or the ride? The ride? Who loves the ride? Who loves the ride? Make some noise, make some noise. Put it in the chat. Who enjoyed the movies? Who enjoyed the movies? The movies? Both, both good. I heard, I heard some hate on the pirate movies. I like the pirate movie. First one was great. All right, anyways. The ride, the ride goes all the way back, uh, well, at Disney World to 1973. It's a classic. Disneyland is started in 1967. In fact, a little trivia here, it was the last ride that Walt Disney himself uh, designed and helped build. Sadly, he died a couple months before it opened. And, uh, but it, it's a classic, it's a famous scene. You know, the pirates are plundering the village. You get in your little boat and that little winding river you go through and see the whole thing. Now, it, it stayed pretty much the same over the years with a couple renovations, a couple changes. One is um, the buy a bride scene. Did y'all see it on the screen? The, the, the one where they're kind of auctioning off the winches. Guess what? They changed that one. Probably, I know pirates were not known for their social sensitivity, but they got rid of that one a few years ago. Probably, I would agree, that was a good change to make. The pirates of the Caribbean, yeah, right there it is, right there, Pirates of the Caribbean. Probably not a good idea, they're auctioning off the women of the village. Uh, but another renovation happened when the movies became so successful, they, they tweaked the storyline. And they introdu introduced some of the characters from the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, like uh, Captain Barbosa and Captain Jack were both introduced to the movie. So they have, you know, animatronic characters of Johnny Depp, you know, and Captain Barbosa. And so as you go through now, it tells that story. Well, if you're a fan of the movies and the ride, you'd wish you were there in Disneyland uh, uh, 2017, April 26, because Johnny Depp himself dressed up in full Captain Jack gear and makeup and he took his place where the animatronic character typically is. And as people kind of came by in their boats, the real Johnny Depp said, I think his line was, says, Oi, what you looking at, matey? But the funny thing was, Johnny said for the first two hours, no one paid any attention to him. Wow. Why? Because the animatronic is so realistic, they didn't know that he wasn't just an animatronic character. And he finally had to start interacting with people on a personal level, calling out what they were wearing or their hat and stuff. And then they figured out, oh, it's Johnny Depp. Why did they not notice? They were surprised that he was there. Hey, chapter three, Moses is surprised. Who shows up in his desert? God. You can't tell when God's going to show up in your life. In some special and powerful way. I know he's always present but the way he'll manifest himself in a unique way so you just never know. Be prepared, it might be today. I'm hoping during this conversation. So God shows up. You can put your hands together for God's way he pops in your life in profound ways. And so I wanna give Moses a little latitude. He, he didn't have this planned, right? And by the way, God has not spoken to a human being in this powerful and personal way in almost 500 years. And Moses didn't think he'd be the guy. Now, if you recall, 40 years before, 
40 years ago, he thought he was a person of purpose back then, a person with a divine destiny. Maybe I can even deliver my people. You see, back 40 years before, he lived in the palace. He was a member of the royal family. He had connections. He knew people, had influence. But that was a long time ago. Chapter 2, verse 23, a long period of time had passed. He's been in the wilderness, the desert, emitting all these years. And on a, on a random day, God shows up. And the conversation begins like this. We'll pick it up in verse four. I know the readers did a beautiful job, but verse four, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look at the burning bush, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Verse five on the screen behind me. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals. Thank you, sandals. Put that in the chat, sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. All right, let's, let's give Moses some points here. One thing I like about this, this initial part of the conversation, Moses doesn't draw any rash God conclusions based on a first impression. I mean, some people, maybe early in life, get some limited information about God, and they make these choices and conclusions about God, and they kind of lock down. Moses didn't do that. Right? If Moses would have drew his information on God or conclusions based on these first verses, he just thought, oh my gosh, who knew? God is a bush and he hates shoes for some reason. But he stays engaged. Good for Moses. I want to point that out because I meet a lot of people who have very strong God opinions. And if you drill down, it's based on information about God, they, they, they limited information they got very early in life perhaps, often from their family of origin. They've taken their faith or religious beliefs from their family of origin and not, have not ex examined that on their own. No, no firsthand research, no, no consideration. Hey, does this even work for me? Is this making sense? Do your homework on God. Research God. Hey, it's the greatest question there is. Gets no bigger. Is there really a God? Did this God make me? Does he love me? Does, does this God have a personal plan for my life the way the Bible teaches? In fact, let me drill down. Let me get controversial. Is Jesus who the Bible says he was? Oh, guess what? If you're here, you're watching online or maybe first or second time in our church, do your due diligence on Jesus. Forget the fact he's the founder of the greatest religion and the largest religion in human history. Just pull that aside. His historical and sociological impact is unparalleled. No, stay with me. No other leader in history has had the impact of a 33-year-old rabbi from Israel, a second-rate nation back in the day. Nobody. No, no president, no premier, no prime minister, no king, no Caesar. In fact, Moses is talking with pharaohs. You know, pharaohs were mighty leaders of the only world superpower. You know, pioneers in civilization built pyramids. No pharaohs as famous as Jesus. Stare at me. Put the names of three pharaohs in the chat, I dare you, without Googling it first. There were 170 pharaohs. Can you name three? Can you name three? You'd be like, uh, okay, uh, uh, King Tut. King Tut, I think he was a pharaoh. And then uh, 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 Cleopatra was kind of like a girl pharaoh, perhaps. And then number three, no idea, right? But Jesus, billions, I said billions of people know his name. People on every single continent know. They may not all be Jesus followers, but they've heard the name, the impact. Do your homework on Jesus. And, and sometimes, you know, if I talk to someone who's had that, that kind of locked down early impression about Jesus, and I say, what do you think about Jesus? They'll say something like this. Say, well, Jesus, um, I, look, I don't think he was like the savior and, and Messiah and supernatural, David, like you believe. But I do believe that Jesus was, uh, well, based on his words, a great religious teacher, a great religious philosopher. I, I, I think he said wonderful things. And I would say, great, that's all true. All true. But that's all you said, that Jesus is a human being that said these great things. That just tells me you have not done your homework on Jesus. Stay with me. Jesus said things unlike anybody else. So those famous things you've heard, like, you know, turn the other cheek, or loving your neighbor as yourself, or forgiving 70 times, seven, all those go back to Jesus. He said these wonderful things, so you're right. He is a great religious leader. He said wonderful things, but he also said that he was God's son. Right. Said he was God's son, and he said, uh, I am the pathway to heaven. Right. Now, if he's just a human being who's very insightful, but saying these things, that makes no sense. And let me just show you one time he says something. Look, John 14, verse 6 is on the side screen right now. Look what Jesus says. And if he's a human moral teacher, this makes no sense. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth. I'll stop right there. 
He is wide open for anybody. He says, I, I'm the way. Doesn't matter your background, your baggage, your ethnicity, your education, even your past religious tradition, I am so open to you. Man, this is wonderfully democratic. No matter who you are, I am open. I am, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But no one, say it, no one comes to the Father except through me. Now listen, stay with me. Stay with me. They're applauding because they believe Jesus is the Son of God. But if he's just a human being, a great teacher who says, guess what, no one gets to heaven, that, there's only three options. Because a, a human being saying that, he'd have to either be a lunatic, I mean crazy. He'd have to be delusional. I mean, as crazy as someone saying, hey, I, I'm a green avocado, <laughs> saying I'm the Son of God, pathway to heaven. Or the second option would be, uh, he's a liar. He's not delusional, he's deceptive. It's, it's a big God con. He's trying to rip people off or something. But how do you reconcile either of those two options with these words? When you look at his mercy, his kindness, his compassion, when you see the most emotionally and mental balanced person in history, it doesn't make sense that he's a lunatic or a liar. And if you do your homework, that leaves only one option. He is the Lord. He's exactly who he said he was, who the Bible says that he is the son of God and he's your door to heaven. Do your homework. Moses stays engaged. So here back in Exodus chapter three, when God shows up by way of a bush, calls his name, says, take off your Nikes, he does it. I mean, here, here's, here's Moses, he's, he, he stays engaged. Yes, he's confused, he's frightened, he's shoeless, but he stays in the conversation. Now, where the conversation really hits it for Moses, where the plot clots for Moses is about verse 10. Verse 10 is on the screen behind me. So here's what God says. So now go, I am sending great reading. Put you in the chat. I'm sending you to Pharaoh. Guess what? Here's the door. To bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt, verse 11, but Moses says to God, who am I? One more time. But Moses says to God slowly, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who, who, who am I? It's fascinating for me, fascinating. Okay, let me show you a couple things about this. Who, who, who am I? Who am I? Okay, uh, Moses, guess what? You're the answer. You're the answer. See, two million Hebrews are in bondage for centuries. They're crying out with that problem, and I'm choosing you to be the answer. You may be the answer to someone's prayer. See, because back verse 7, this is verse 10. I'm sending you. Verse 11, Moses says, who am I? Back up to verse 7, God says, I've been listening. I've been listening to the cry of the, of the Egyptian, of the cry of the Hebrews. I, I've heard their prayer. I've heard their prayer. Now, stay with me. We don't know when this conversation happened. Is there a date in your Bible? Anybody see in the margin, there's a date. This conversation happened August 13th, uh, year 1231 BC on a Thursday. Anybody have that? So we don't know exactly, even the day of the week this happened, but I guarantee you this, whatever day it was, way far away in Egypt, there was a Hebrew, probably thousands of Hebrews, but there was a Hebrew crying out to God, God, help us. God, we've been in bondage so long. God, we've been oppressed, we're treated like animals. God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, rescue us, help us. And on that Thursday, what changed in that Hebrew's life? Nothing. Wow. Wow. Nothing. He could understandably conclude, hey, God's not listening. Wow. God's cell phone is on airplane mode. Heaven is silent. Because I prayed and asked God to help with my problem and God's done nothing. My life is the same on Tuesday as it was on Wednesday as it was on, on, on Thursday. Man, life is just the same. But what he doesn't know, while he's talking to God and assuming that God's not listening, God is talking to Moses and Midian. Moses, it's you. I'm sending you. You see, guess what? Heaven was working on his behalf, though the Hebrew did not know it. While he's praying, thinking God is not listening, God is talking to Moses, who's going to be the answer to the problem, but the answer's not listening. So what God's doing on that very same Thursday, he's talking to the answer, trying to get the answer to accept his assignment and go. You think nothing's happening? I'm telling you, heaven may be working mightily on your behalf. You hang in there. You stay with it. It's a fascinating conversation, 
Burning bush shows up, take off your shoes. Uh, God introduces himself. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh, Moses, I know your family were, were tight before. I'm sending you. Moses balks at that. We understand. Why did he balk at that? Well, he's, he's been in Midian. Chapter 2, verse 23, last week. For such a long period of time. You know, he, the thing happened back in Egypt and he bumped off that Egyptian slave master and I can talk about the morality of that or the wisdom of that, but guess what, it didn't work. The methodology was not successful. You cannot do God's work using the devil's methodology. And so he's forced to flee from Pharaoh. He runs from Pharaoh. What happens, he's there a long time in the wilderness and his 40s roll by and his 50s roll by and his 60s roll by and his 70s roll by. It's been a long time. But guess what, he went there to hide. He went there to hide. And I would argue he hid successfully. He, he, he hid from Egypt, the Egyptians. He hid from Pharaoh. He hid from his past. But you cannot hide from God's purpose. He finds himself in the middle of nowhere. But in the middle of nowhere, he finds himself. Have you ever lost you? Have you lost you? Have you lost a sense of your, your purpose in life? Have you, if you ever lose you, put God in charge of the search party to find you. So God comes looking for Moses. Even the language is so definitive. God says, Moses, Moses, Moses. Like, here I am. You found me. I didn't know where I was. And God reintroduces the door of his purpose. And what does he say? I'm in. Been waiting for decades. Let's go get him. Set the people free. No, he says, who am I? God. Great idea, phenomenal. Somebody needs to do this. Amen. And God, you may not know this, but uh, 40 years ago, I lived in a palace, a member of the royal, royal family, had connections, influence. Maybe back then, but now I've been a shepherd for 40. I just got a stick. I got a stick in my hand. All I have is a stick in my hand. Wait till next week, we'll talk about the stick. Oh, the stick is good stuff. Wait till next week, the stick. Be here, bring someone, hit them with a stick and get them to church if you have to, right? <laughs> the, the stick is next week, the stick. How God will use what's already in your hand. Anyways, uh, all I got is that. So God, someone needs to do this, but <laughs> you think it's me. I'm an octogenarian, right? I don't, I don't, I'm not as fast and quick as I used to be. Excuses, all these, he's going, all these excuses, going to roll these excuses next week. These excuses, guess what? They're lame. They're terrible, but they're honest. He's not being lazy. He's not lacking empathy. empathy. He's, he's just been beat down for 40 years. Who am I? Who am I? Now, put the words up there, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Uh, it's, his, it's his spiritual inferiority complex. Someone needs to do it, God, but not me. I, I don't have the right experience, right aptitudes, right ability. Somebody, oh yeah, great idea. Needs to happen, but not me. I can't, thank you so much, I'm honored, not me. He's, he's, he's insecure. Put it in the chat or raise your hand in the room. Have you ever been insecure, ever been insecure, overwhelmed? Raise your hand. A few guys are too insecure to raise your hand. Raise your hand because we've all been there. So if you're a Christian and you're insecure, when the door is presented by God, you will not have enough confidence to pass through the door. On the other side, there are some cocky Christians, some prideful Christians kind of walk in, right? All, you pick them up, the way they talk about their life or their blessings or their accomplishments, they spiritualize, right? You know, you know that, right? And that's, that's problematic because God has a huge issue with pride. In fact, there's many things in life that will mess us up, that will cancel out God's goodness. You know, we stumble sin, many, many descriptions of sin in the Bible, but only like six, seven things, half a dozen things that God says, I hate, I hate. One on the short list is pride. So where is the biblical balance on this? How do I, how do I not fill for my moment, step through my door of destiny? Okay, let me present something or represent something we came up with some years ago called the swagometer. The swagometer is on the big LED behind me. Thank you, production team, for this. And this helps us calibrate our confidence. The swagometer is a, a continuum of confidence, and you stand somewhere on this. In fact, do right now some honest self-diagnostic, if you will, all right? Here, here we go. So some Christians, yeah, it's... It is arrogance. In fact, with them, they have the spirit like, hey, hey, I'm the man. Yeah. I'm the woman. Yo, yo, God, you are so lucky to have me on your team. What I can do, my abilities, my gifting, now my time is very precious, God, but I'll give you a little bit of my time. 
a little bit of my influence, maybe a little of my money. You're so lucky to have me. Again, I'm telling you, man, God hates pride. Yeah. And I know pride is, is in vogue right now in our society. You watch, I love football, man. I love college football, but man, as soon as a guy does something, man, he runs and sticks his face in the camera and pounds his chest and everybody talks trash and social media. We all self-promote all the time. It's just, it's just, it's just pride. Right. Yeah. You gotta have passion. Yeah. But man, people mess up. Probably Moses back 40 years before, an issue of pride. God, I got this. Delivering the people. I live in a palace. I know people. Pride. God cannot use pride. Now, on the other side of the continuum, some Christians battle with insecurity or fear or anxiety. They, they battle on this side of the equation right here. And for that person, it's not, I'm the man. It's like, I need to man up. Yeah. I, at Moses here at age 80 is on this side now. He feels like he missed his moment. Every time he looks at that stick, he feels like a failure. I used to have like a scepter, now I got a stick. And you know, every time he looks at his life and he has a nice wife and has kids and has a degree of success, but he has this insecurity because I don't have the right abilities, not the right aptitudes. I, I lack the proper experience. Surely someone else is more qualified. I feel overwhelmed. Where God wants us to be is in this middle place where we have confidence. In fact, let me borrow a term that a couple of colleagues of mine created, not just confidence, but Godfidence. Say with me, one, two, three, Godfidence. Loudly, one, two, three, Godfidence. Put Godfidence to the chance. This is, a, this is a confidence based on who my God is. And the attitude is not, I'm the man, right? Or I need to man up. I'm God's man. You're a God's woman. In this season, in this moment, my God has called me. He's positioned the door. The door presents opportunity and opposition. But trusting God, I'm gonna go through the door. See, I think that's why they have the conversation because Moses starts his excuses already. Uh, well, again, they're fun. Wait for the next couple weeks. They're so very fun. And they're, they're so like all of us too. We just kind of recycle bad biblical behavior sometimes, don't we? So anyways, but I like in verse 14, where Moses you know, says, hey God, what if, what if, what if, you can what if yourself to death. What if, what if they ask your name? What they ask you, what do I say? And then God in verse 14, uh, verse 14, he says, he said, uh, I am. My name is I am. No famous fact, I am. Now, if you know that and you've read that before, that doesn't surprise you. But kind of pretend you're Moses, put yourself in Moses' sandals back in that day. And he asked God his name. And God's already said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, what's, what's your proper name? And, and, and he's waiting for the answer. And by the way, you may not know this. In the original Hebrew, there's no punctuation, nor even vowels. Now, we're very confident in your English Bible or your Creole Bible or your Spanish Bible where the punctuation goes. But let's pretend like after God said, my name is I am, like, like there, there, there's an ellipse, right? I am dot, dot, dot. I, I am. Because that, what is your name? I am so-and-so, right? I am so-and-so. So what is your name, God? I am. <laughs> Moses presses in. You are who? No, I said, I am. He, he, he doesn't say, I am the God who's like a mountain. I am the God who's like an ocean. I'm a God who's like a supernova. No, too small, too small, too small, too small. He made all those things with a word, right? He made all those things with a word. He, there can be no analogy that does justice to the scope and scale of his power and magnificence. Uh, I just, I am, period. And Moses didn't understand everything that meant, but I think he understood this. Well, well God, if you are I am, if God is I am, then me, Moses, if you are I am, I am not. Oh, it's, it's not about me, is it? It's not about my successes or my failures. It's not about my experience or lack thereof. It's not about my education that I have six degrees or my GED. It's not about whether I'm a single parent or live in, live in a, a typical family. It's not about what part of the world I watch this. I mean, last night we had people watching online from the Bahamas and Jamaica. And we had somebody literally from Zimbabwe watching at midnight. Wherever this finds you, listen, you are God's person. Whatever that customized calling is, step through the door. Let me close this. So, so my house, my house has that, like that outer door, the courtyard door, and people just stand there and knock 
and don't find satisfaction and don't step in. I mean, if, if we don't know you're there, we can't invite you in to have a meal with us or fellowship with us or laugh with us, right? You can't, but you get to the inner door, it changes everything because that's the door of relationship. It's kind of the same thing again. Let me circle back around to Revelation chapter three where Jesus says something about a door. And if you're, you're watching right now, if you're in this room right now and don't know for certain, certain and sure that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, meaning this, that you know right now that you're saved. Your sins have been forgiven. That the Holy Spirit lives in your life. If you don't know that for sure, let's, let's nail that down. Well, David, can I, can I do that? Yeah, the same way you pass through the threshold of a door. Now, Jesus said in John chapter 10, he said, I am the door. He said, way too, but he said, door. <laughs> uh, I'm the door, pass the door. Look at Revelation chapter three, verse 20. And the speaker here is Jesus. Mark, if you miss every other verse, everything I say, please catch this. It's on the giant LED behind me. Here I am, Jesus the speaker. I stand at the door. Not talking about the door of your house or your SUV, door of your life, door of your heart. I stand at the door and guess what? He flips it. I'm knocking. I'm initiating. You won't come to me, I'll come to you. Moses, don't need to come to me, I'll show up in your desert. I'll come to you right where you are in your mess, in your brokenness, in your shame, in your addiction, in your dysfunction. I will come to you. I come to the door of your life and I knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. There's no qualifiers. They say, if you're a really good person, if you have it all together, if you're always kind and generous and polite, no, whoever you are, I will come in. Has there been that moment you've invited Christ into the door of your life? If not, this is your door. This is your moment. Let's step across the threshold of faith, whether you're watching online, whether here in the States or some other place, or here in this room right now, this is your door of destiny. I would love the honor of leading you in, in a Romans 320 prayer where you can invite Christ to be your personal Lord and Savior. Well, David, how do I do that? A prayer. It says in Romans chapter 10, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen right now, I wanna lead you in a salvation prayer. I wanna ask everybody in the room to bow their heads and close their eyes. And if you're a Christian right now, if you know that you're saved, pray your guts out. Because yes, okay. someone six feet away from you needs to make this their moment. So if you wanna be certain and sure that you're saved, that Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior, that you've passed the inner door, the inner sanctum of relationship with Him. Take my words and make this your prayer. The words aren't magic words. God's not measuring your words. He's actually weighing your heart right now. Just if you're sincere, pray something like, okay, Jesus, I'm in. I'm saying yes. Uh, if you're knocking on the door to my life, please, please come in. I, I want you to be my Lord and my Savior and my hero and my best friend. I believe that you died on that cross to pay for my sins. You arose again and you're alive right now. I, I make you the Lord of my life. You be the CEO of me. When you come into my life, you take charge of everything. Thank you for saving me. For I make this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Wow, somebody prayed that prayer. Somebody online prayed that prayer. Well done, walk in the family of God. Hey, real quick, before I dismiss you in the room, just a thought, don't get up quite yet if you don't mind. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, phenomenal. You are now a saved person. Why? Because God made you a promise. That promise on the screen now applies to you. So guess what, it's done. Doesn't matter if you felt it, you were emotional, pfft, doesn't matter. God keeps His promises. Now here's the cool thing. Cool thing and a bit of a thing. The only, the only people who know you're saved right now is you and Jesus. And this is way too good to keep to yourself. So if you're watching online, uh, Pastor Mike's about to appear. He's gonna give you a little number you can text. You just text the word salvation. We'll respond to you sometime this week in a personal way. But in this room, the prayer partners are gonna make their way forward right now. We got prayer partners again, and they will stay six feet away from you if need be. But you'll come here. What I wanna really encourage you to do, they're not gonna quiz you, embarrass you, keep you, detain you. But you might, uh, might wonder, what do I do now? What's my next step? How do I feel solid about this? Would you come take a few moments and come to them and just say, I prayed that prayer with David, amen? amen? And then everybody, next week, yeah. next week. I'm gonna talk about the stick and the excuses next week, all right? So I'm gonna hit you with the stick if you don't come next week. Bring somebody, share the word it's saved. God bless you, have a great week. We love you. Thanks for being part of Church by the Glades today. Yeah.